Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, where we help new and beginning teachers navigate through those crazy first years of teaching so you can maintain your sanity and personal life. Here's your host, Kim LaPree. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. Today on episode 59, I have a special guest, Elena Spathis, who is a Spanish teacher in northern New Jersey. And the reason why I wanted to interview Elena was twofold. First of all, I have a listener named Zachary, who is also a foreign language teacher, who was asking me some questions about foreign language that I honestly didn't have any answers to. And so I really wanted to find those answers and help him out. And also because I had come across an article in Edutopia that Elena had written that I thought was fabulous. And I realized that with the need that Zachary had and probably other foreign language teachers listening to this podcast and the level of expertise that Elena has, it was definitely a really good fit. So Elena and I discuss the struggles that foreign language teachers have. She gives a lot of amazing advice on how to get foreign language students to speak in class, about how to get them more excited about reading and writing and making the curriculum more relevant in general. She has amazing ideas that I kind of wish my foreign language teacher had used. So I'm excited for you guys to hear this. But first, If you missed it last week, I just launched a brand new course called the End of the Year Sanity Saver. And this is basically where I put together all of my best strategies for ending the school year on a positive note. And doing this not only makes it so that you're less stressed out at the end of the year, which we all are. I mean, I know you're looking forward to the end of the year and the beginning of your summer, but it can be really, really chaotic and very, very frustrating as a new teacher if you don't follow some of the recommendations that I make in this course. Seriously. So not only will you set up for a less stressful end of the year, then when you have to come back for next year, you have the system set up. Everything is ready to go. You don't have to spend a month into your summer getting everything ready again, and you can be relatively less stressed out when you come back. So you don't have to take my word for it. I had about 100 students go through this, and they all thought that it was great information. These are teachers that were new and even veteran teachers who went through this and were like, you know what? I didn't even think about half this stuff, and it really helped me reframe some things that I'm doing in my classroom. It helped me thinking about packing up my classroom and everything else that I mentioned in the course. So if you just want to check it out and see what it is that I cover, then go to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash E-O-T-Y, which stands for end of the year, and take a look at it. And I assure you that when you go through this, You're going to have these systems yourself in place and you can just reuse this every year, which also means that when you're not stressed out, you can enjoy these last few weeks or the last couple of months with your students. So again, that's teachersneedteachers.com slash E-O-T-Y. This is Gabriel Carrillo from the EdTech Bytes podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you are listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. And get ready, because the learning begins in 3, 2, 1. Hi, Elena. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be able to talk. So can you tell my listeners about your teaching experience and how you came to your current position? Sure. So this is actually my fourth full year teaching. So September of 2019 is going to mark my fifth year. Time flies. I can't believe it. (laughs) I... 
um, I obtained this position straight out of college. So I had just graduated from a five-year master's program through Rutgers University. And um, this was the first job posting I saw. I applied and it ended up being really lucky. So um, this is actually a school that is near where I grew up, which is funny. Um, And I've been working ever since. And so teaching Spanish, what got you into doing that? So teaching Spanish was always something that I had in the back of my mind. I entered college as a Spanish major, kind of unsure what direction I wanted to take. But uh, being the fact that I am of Greek heritage, I have always traveled a lot ever since I was a child. I always had a real fascination for other languages, other cultures, other ways of life. And when I was in high school, I really started to pick up Spanish pretty fluently. And I just, it became part of my life. And then I decided to go into the teaching direction with it. And was high school the grade that you preferred or would you have taken middle school or junior high as well? High school was definitely the age that I preferred. I really and honestly could not see myself doing elementary or middle school, maybe (laughs) eighth grade. I don't know. I give all the elementary and middle school teachers a lot of credit. Um, But high school is always where I felt at least that with Spanish, I could really see some you know, some development there. Not to say that you can't see that with the younger ages, but I wanted to see them at a more mature age with it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And in terms of your school, what are the demographics like in your community? Just so that my reader or my listeners have an idea of the area in which you teach. Sure. So the area in which I teach is actually in northern Bergen County, New Jersey. So we are at um, the northeast end of the state and we actually are in very close proximity to New York City. So Mm -hmm. many students' parents commute to New York City every day. It is a very suburban, affluent district. It's a nice place uh, to live. Um, it's really nice and it is densely populated, but there is still a lot of green, uh, over here. So it's a nice area of New Jersey. And as I said, a lot of students, parents are New York city commuters. So that's something common that we see. And I would say overall that many of the students are involved in sports, extracurricular activities. Um, so definitely it's that New York City pace, very busy schedule type of lifestyle. Oh, nice. So in your pocket of New Jersey, what makes your school you know, different or maybe an ideal place for families to want to send their kids to? Um, I would say that in general, across the board, um, the schools in Bergen County uh, really are a nice place to go because you are in such close proximity to really, I would say, probably one of the most major cities, not just in the United States, but in the world. So it's really nice that we can very easily take our students on trips Mm. uh, to different, I mean, to all different museums in New York City. I remember even when I was in high school, because I'm from this area, I had the opportunity to go to all of these landmarks. And I felt really lucky about that. I mean, I didn't realize it maybe at the time, but later on, I was like, wow, I got to see all of these things that are on people's bucket lists as a student in high school. So I think that that's definitely an advantage we have. Um, And I think that it's it's just a nice place to be because you have that combination of suburban life, but you can also easily access a city. And that's something that we all enjoy. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Because I know when I visited New York before, I felt like 
I had to see everything all at once because I was only there for a short amount of time. But with you living so close, you could just pop on over and just sort of make your way through all the major landmarks over there and, you know, interesting places to see without having to rush it. So I'm, I'm really jealous about that. <laughs> you know, the only thing I'm not jealous about is the weather, though, because I live in Southern California. Oh, and we're so- very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it gets so hot. It's so cold where you're at. It is. It is. So a lot of pretty much every high school actually has some sort of foreign language program. And I haven't encountered a lot of foreign language teachers that listen to my podcast necessarily. A lot of them are elementary school teachers or just regular middle school and high school teachers that teach core subjects. So um, I'm kind of learning here from you about this. So what I'm wondering is with foreign language teachers, what is the greatest struggle that you encounter on a regular basis and why does this happen? Well, I think that for those of us who are really passionate about the language and about the culture we teach, it is kind of saddening to see sometimes a lack of passion and interest in the students. So, um, Being bilingual, it really is an incredible asset to have and not as many students or actually people in general, I would say, realize this, which can feel disappointing at times because, you know, in the United States, foreign language classes are seen more of as electives uh, or as special classes. Right. Right. This is not the case, though, in like every other country in the world, for example, language courses are core subjects in European countries. So for those of us who are of other ethnicities and who teach a foreign language or who maybe were exposed to a different school system, it's kind of shocking that it's treated as an elective. Um, And that can be disappointing at times. I mean, there are always many students who really love the subject and love the language, and that really makes us happy. But it definitely does make us a bit sad when we feel like there's a lack of recognition of, wow, how wonderful is it if you can end high school being bilingual or proficient in another language? It's kind of something that many people over look. Right. And especially because I'm I'm imagining that a lot of high school students are taking it because it's required for college or colleges want it as opposed to, let's say, English and math, where it's just given that you take, you know, English, math and science. But some of them will take the bare minimum amount of language to get into college and they don't see it as that opportunity to enrich themselves. And, you know, I was thinking again, what you're saying about in Europe, a lot of Europeans speak two or three languages. And Mm -hmm. here we are, one of the most diverse countries in the world, and most of us only speak one. Right. And that's the irony right there is that we unfortunately really trail in terms of our language proficiency. And there's no reason for it. right? Right. And I remember being in college, actually, as an undergrad at Rutgers, how many of my friends, when they heard that I was a Spanish major, came to me and said, oh, my God, the biggest mistake I made was not taking it seriously in high school, because whether they were in the health profession, the medical profession, if they spoke Spanish, that would have helped them out a lot, especially in New Jersey, in which Spanish is such a common language. So I think I tell my high schoolers that I think, though, part of it is a maturity thing. You know, they haven't really gotten to see the world yet. And I think that, unfortunately, it's a realization that comes to them later. So maybe some of them in college really do pick up their interest again with it. I think that hopefully in the future we can see a little bit of a turnaround with this. And especially a lot of positions require you to be bilingual. In fact, some really good teaching positions out here require you to know Spanish in addition to English. And there were some really cool jobs that I could have applied for if I had been bilingual in Spanish. So it's right. it's not just for the sake of high school or college. It's life. 
Right. And it's a skill that you can have for the rest of your life. It's not something that only applies to one class, right? It's the same as when we learn to read, when we learn to write. I mean, doing that in another language, how special is that? Right. Now, I remember in French class that I could read and hear French really well, but I had a hard time speaking. And so Mm -hmm. I was wondering, what are some strategies for language teachers in terms of getting reluctant students to speak in class? Because a lot of times we feel stupid. So I was just wondering how Mm -hmm. to help us get past that. Well, I think that it's, of course, very common for students to obviously feel really self-conscious when it's time to speak in a foreign language because it is foreign to them. So I think it's really important to first create a non-threatening environment in which students feel that it's okay to make mistakes. So from my perspective, that's really important, especially because for half of the day, I actually do teach Spanish one. So I teach the most basic introductory course with students who have no prior knowledge of the language. And it's important to create a classroom environment that's really positive and that the students know, okay, I'm going to give it a try, but my teacher's not going to yell at me or embarrass me for it. Um, So definitely um, some easy ways to do that are, you know, greeting students at the door, having a smile on your face, applauding them when they make an effort. Um, I also think that part of the issue why maybe students aren't speaking as much in language classes is that they maybe are not engaged. I actually came to the realization at some point at the beginning of my teaching career where I was like, wait, nobody's raising their hand because I think I'm just asking boring questions. (laughs) And it just, it just dawned on me, like what I'm asking is really not that interesting. And I decided to, you know, really look back and try to figure out, well, let me engage them. So bringing in pop culture, um, selecting some really compelling images or using videos as talking points that really gets the kids excited and makes them want to speak because it's not just enough to present something interesting. You want them to actually have that desire to contribute. Um, I think another really important thing is don't do all of the students speaking on the spot, like just question and answering. Allow the students to speak in pairs with a partner in a small group. That's a lot less intimidating for them. And I, and from my own experience with repeated practice, speaking in pairs or in small groups, students Students then slowly develop their confidence and then oftentimes you'll see them start raising their hands when you as the teacher start asking questions in front of the room. So um, I think that those are all just small ways, small things that you can do to really get the students to speak. And I would say for every teacher and the same goes in foreign language, don't be afraid to laugh with the students and connect with them. Mm -hmm. because that's really how they start to feel comfortable and and really allow them to enjoy the language. It's not always about being perfect or being accurate all the time. It's about enjoying it, too. Right. And how do they react when you bring in, you know, Spanish pop culture or have them learn about the Spanish culture? Are they... You know, do they get into that or are they like, this is strange or how do they react? They sometimes they are surprised at first or might express, oh, my God, you know, they they might demonstrate some reactions of shock. But even at shock is, you know, it's something interesting that we can start a conversation about. So immediately it's an easy way for us to really compare and contrast between whichever country I'm presenting about to the United States. So how is this similar? How is this different? And when you bring in those cultural comparisons, it definitely brings the language more to life for them. And they really do become interested in the culture. I would say nearly all of the students at any level, if you really integrate that and 
start talking about those things with them, they get right into it. Nice. I can imagine. Um, mm-hmm. Especially if you bring in like food. <laughs> That's everyone's <laughs> oh, favorite, <yes>. right? <laughs> um, and how about reading, like literacy? What are some be- best practices that can help students read and write in the language? Because that part seems like the most boring to them. Mm-hmm. So reading and writing for me really go hand in hand. And I think that First and foremost, repeated practice is really important. So I would say to definitely try and integrate a variety of texts, whether it's a it's a short article, a short story, a poem. Um, I also would say to really try and use authentic texts when possible with the novice learners and regularly when working with intermediate or advanced learners. So, for example, with my Spanish one students, some examples of authentic texts that I could use are short stories or an advertisement in Spanish. That's a small amount of text, but it's still authentic. And those are also really interesting for cultural comparisons. Like every year when I'm teaching about food and healthy food versus fast food, I always show them videos or advertisements from Domino's in a Spanish speaking country or McDonald's in Spain. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how it's similar, different. And in an advertisement, or in a commercial, there's a small amount of language. They're quick and short. So the Spanish one students can understand the main message, but it's still authentic, which is great. And then with my advanced students, I really stick to authentic texts all the time. So a lot of news articles, uh, some poetry is really great too. So I would say to definitely integrate a variety of different texts, um, maybe a little chapter book with the beginner students. I would also say to read aloud with them kind of to model that pronunciation, allow them to read together so that they can work on the pronunciation by listening to each other, exposing them to native speakers is great as well. And then to accompany these reading activities, um, come writing activities. So this really involves implementing some pre-reading while reading and post reading activities, graphic organized, of course, are a great tool for students at any level. I really think that, especially at the novice levels, the students need to hear, see, and write out repeated structures in order for them to stick. So if they're reading, they should be writing and vice versa. Um, And I think that, you know, there are so many things that we can do to really help strengthen their skills and repeated practice is really necessary. So I really try to make sure that they're doing some speaking, reading, writing, and listening every day to really combine those skills. And I love that you use real world examples because it puts it in context because otherwise it can be kind of boring just to fill out worksheets or mm-hmm. you know, just to read something that the teacher gives me. But if I see it come to life and see, oh, this actually has a practical you know, application, then I can see them getting a lot more excited about that. Right, exactly. Or even selecting a really fun chapter book to read with them can be great. You know, they get really into the story. If there's that continuum or that exciting process behind it, bringing it to life, like you said, it really keeps them interested and engaged. Now, speaking of keeping students engaged, I know that you participated in a Twitter chat for Spanish students, and I thought that that was fabulous since it's, you know, a mode that students already use that in Instagram. So can you tell me a little more about how that went and what it was like? Yeah. So last year, some of my students and I participated in the Span Stew chat. It was a fun way to practice Spanish using a few characters. And I did that with my freshman honors class, which I love teaching. I do not teach that class this year. And I really felt like that was the perfect level um, to do it with. It was really fun for the students to not just be using Spanish, 
Spanish on social media, but also the fact that they were able to interact with students across the country. It was really cool for them to see like, oh, this girl responding lives in Ohio. This boy responding lives in Florida. So it was cool for them to connect with other students who were taking Spanish across the United States. And it was also nice to see them really producing the language spontaneously because every few minutes the new question would be posed and they had to answer right away. So there was no preparation beforehand. They were just really answering on the spot, which was good practice for them in a real life conversation. For example, you have to answer on the spot. You're not able to have a stack of note cards and practice (laughs) in front of the mirror for a real life conversation. So it was good for them. And is that still going on now? I actually am not sure if that's still an active chat. Um, I, uh, yeah, with my Spanish one students, perhaps I could participate in that at this point in the year, I didn't really feel that they were ready. Um, and then for my honors for students, I I felt that they're at a more advanced level. So, um, but with that class last year, with those classes that I taught, it was really a nice opportunity for them. And I think they really enjoyed it. That sounds awesome. I love how it's just not typical, you know, textbook Mm -hmm. learning. It's, it's putting them on the spot, literally. (laughs) Right. Um, So speaking of textbooks, I remember hating my French textbook and I just and I see the textbooks nowadays, they're all they're really old and beat up unless you move to an online one. But what I'm wondering is if you come into a teaching position and you see this dusty old textbook and that's all that you have and it's not enough, what should foreign language teachers do? Like, what are some of the best resources you've found to supplement that? Well, I would say that definitely, uh, first and foremost, do your research to find a really good source or a, a book that you feel is a good fit for you. We are fortunate with Spanish to have a lot of options out there. And I have to say that using a textbook that you feel is up to date and a good fit for you as a guide is a useful tool because sometimes there's so much content for us to cover that we're kind of all over the place. So for me personally, I have found referring to a textbook as a guide to be helpful in terms of providing me with content and language targets, but I have always enjoyed being really creative and searching for my own resources. So a lot of times I'll take the topic, I'll take the structures, I'll take some of those language objectives, but then I go off and I create things on my own. I look for videos, I look for images, I look for readings, I create readings, um, and I really can be creative with that. So I would say that, of course, sticking a hundred percent to the book, a hundred percent of the time that is likely going to fall flat, you know, and being creative is really what makes teaching so fun. Um, but I would say really kind of create a bank of resources that you can refer to so that at the beginning of each unit, After you've looked at what are the targets of this unit, you can use the book for a little bit of direction, but then to kind of search for resources on your own. So personally for me, YouTube is of course home to tons of videos and songs I can use in class. Even for example, if I want to use, um, like I had mentioned earlier, an advertisement or a commercial or a song, YouTube has easy access. Um, I also have used This Is Language, which is a paid subscription service, but it offers a series of videos of native speakers in a variety of different languages on all different topics. So it's like a big bank of videos, which are great for listening activities, and they really allow students to see authentic pronunciation from a variety of different countries. Um 
definitely infographics are a great tool at any level. Um, you could find those floating around on Google or on Pinterest. And then for upper level classes, podcasts like I personally use Radio Ambulante, which is a Spanish speaking podcast uh, via NPR um, with my upper level classes. And they love listening to those podcasts because they're basically stories of um, that encompass Latin American culture um, and are it's really like listening to a story through a podcast um, about current events, about um, past events that have affected the Spanish speaking world. So I try to use a combination of a lot of different sources and I really try to get as creative as I can when I'm planning my units. Nice. So the kids sort of get more than, again, just the textbook. They're getting mm -hmm. multiple sources and they love anything multimedia. They do. And I think it is important that for us as teachers, especially with foreign language, because it is such a cumulative type of course, everything builds upon each other because it is requiring some language acquisition, right? I think that it's important to really plan in an organized way. Not every class can be a random topic or a random activity. So that's why there is some sense, of course, in really looking at maybe what are some of the learning targets and language targets of this unit in the book to help you build upon the, that cumulative nature of language acquisition. But then, of course, keeping it creative is what's going to really get the kids engaged. So the textbook is what, and then you come up with your own how. Right. Basically, yeah, I would say, because I would say, I would say that, Having no book at all, if that works for you, that's great. And I know many teachers who really don't use a book whatsoever and are very happy with that. And that's great. Uh, but I think that it's important to make sure that if you're not using a book, that you are still moving in a sequence. Because like I said, it gets tricky if the class is going like, okay, on Monday is this topic, Tuesday, something totally random, Wednesday, we're going back to that topic, you know, there needs to be then a really solid progression of the unit, I would say, but it depends on each person's style, really. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned in the beginning, that you took Spanish in high school. So mm -hmm. as a non native speaker, are there any challenges that you face compared to someone who's a native speaker and what advice can you give to help students learn both the proper language and like idiomatic terms that maybe, you know, you don't use every day because you're not a native speaker. So it definitely, there are some challenges, um, being the fact that I'm not a native speaker. Sometimes, um, I, I feel like, oh, I wish I was teaching about the culture that I grew up with because I would know every detail about it. But the good thing about not being a native speaker is that I did have to learn, for example, all of the grammatical rules behind the language. So from that perspective, I guess it can have its advantages. But anyway, I would say that as a non-native speaker, uh, my advice to fellow non-native speakers who are language teachers is to take your own advice that you give to students to immerse yourself in conversations with native speakers, which is scary, but we have to do it. Yeah. So I would also say to listen to the radio, listen to a podcast or the news in my case in Spanish or in whichever language that you teach read in the language. So these are all techniques that help you to brush up because the reality is if you're not a native speaker and you're not speaking it at home, you have to supplement in other ways. Um, so the fact that I speak Greek gives me an advantage with my pronunciation because it is 
similar pronunciation wise, but for non-natives who are looking to improve their pronunciation, I would say to really practice speaking and listening as much as possible, because believe it or not, we don't necessarily realize this at the time, but if we're constantly listening to the language through an authentic source, like on the radio or on the news, we are definitely exposing ourselves to that. And it's kind of creating, you know, a, a memory in our, in our mind about, okay, this is what that person said, or I heard this journalist use this term the other day, you know, it can really help broaden your vocabulary and obviously improve your listening skills, but also your speaking skills as a result. So I would definitely say there are things that we can easily do to make sure that we brush up our skills as non-native speakers. And definitely also one of my favorite suggestions is go make a friend that is a native speaker of the language you teach <laughs> right. because they can be your go-to source. I, I've done that many times with friends I have who are native speakers of Spanish. I'll run to them or I'll send them a text and say, have you ever used this word to mean this? Or, you know, even to ask them, what's your favorite news source? For example, um, it's good to really have a contact person who is a native speaker of the language you teach that you can go to with those types of questions. And I think it's, it's kind of, I, I like how you mentioned that because you had to learn the language that in a way you can relate to the students so like for me, I teach seventh grade English and I was not a good writer in middle school or high school at all. And so I can relate to the students and I can anticipate the struggles that they're going to have. And I almost feel like that makes me more of an effective teacher because it's not it wasn't easy for me. So I know it's not necessarily going to be easy for them. Right. And being able to anticipate those struggles, I would I would say, too, and remembering how um, you felt and comparing it to how they feel. Yeah, those are definitely advantages, in my opinion. So here in Southern California, we have some schools that are what they call, you know, dual immersion. And so they'll spend all or a part of their day just in Spanish. And these are, you know, not non-native speakers and some but the traditional method here the traditional model is where it's maybe half and half or the teacher tries to speak as much of the foreign language until the kids start to fall off because they have no idea what's going on so what are your thoughts on that more immersive model versus combined I think that when students are immersed in a language, they definitely acquire it over time upon hearing repeated structures, seeing gestures or with visual aids provided by the teacher. So while an immersive experience at the beginning might be like, oh, my God, none of them know what's going on. They do catch on. Um so I think it's really amazing. And I've seen examples of immersion schools where you have young children who really become proficient in another language, which is awesome. It's wonderful for me to see. And the same goes for dual immersion, I think is, is great too. I just personally feel that it really depends on the individual child. I would not say that it's necessarily the best fit for every kid. I think that it depends. Um, and it's important to really consider what each student's needs are, you know, um, definitely, I would say for students who maybe exhibit high levels of stress or anxiety, it might be a little bit of a rocky road at first, which is not to say that they shouldn't give it a try, but, um, I'm not, sure if maybe it's the end all be all answer for every student. However, I do think that there is a lot of value in immersion programs because I think that, again, it's really giving the kids an additional wonderful skill that they can carry on for the rest of their lives. And it's really interesting to hear that there are so many schools that offer such programs in California because we do not have as many on the East Coast, for my knowledge, at least. It seems like most of them, 
that are successful start with the younger grades though so right. we're, you I, know elementary is that definitely so then definitely. it seems like it'd be harder in high school to do you know complete immersion because it is isn't it harder to learn a language as we get older i think that one of the main factors that makes it harder is the fact that our high school students become so self-conscious. I think that a big benefit of the elementary level students who are immersed is that they don't have that same fear or self-consciousness of making mistakes. And they're constantly putting themselves out there and communicating in the language. They're more open to it. So that's something that I think, um, is presents a big contrast scientifically. Um, I've read a lot of conflicting studies. I've read research that says that there is an ideal age, that there's not. There is a critical period of learning language. And it, to my knowledge, it is easier when students are younger to acquire a language because it sets that norm for them. And if we think about it, if an elementary age student is immersed in a Spanish class, think about how many years that student has to brush up on that and Mm -hmm. to perfect that and to work on that. So they having that longer span of time, of course, works in their favor. So I think that they're really neat. I think immersion programs are um, a really interesting concept. And I'm curious to see if they gain more popularity across um, our country. Do you have the option to do that? Could you just do with your beginning class 100% immersion or do you need to follow a certain model? Um, I would say that I aim to do the goal is 90% target language use and reserving that 10% English for when it's necessary. Um, In reality, with Spanish one, some days it will be that 90% target language achievement and other days it won't be. And it depends. Um, that's the goal for my upper level classes for like my honor Spanish four class. It is full Spanish all the time. So of course the higher the level of the class, obviously the less English they need. They should not need any English by this point. I mean, every group is different. Right. And as always, I think you really have to base it off of what the students need. If the students are in a higher level course, but maybe um, have some more challenges with it, obviously I have to work with them and see where they're at. No, that makes sense. Especially I can imagine with the, the earlier classes, they need that scaffolding with, with the English so that if they are completely lost or if you're trying to explain how to conjugate something, trying to explain conjugation in Spanish, you know, when they don't even know what it means to conjugate, I'm sure it would be too confusing for them. Right. Yeah. Images and gestures or acting it out, almost to be doing like charades with them <laughs> is is really the norm with the Spanish one classes. Right. Now, my podcast is geared towards new teachers. And so I was wondering, are there any challenges that are specific for new language teachers? And what are some tips that you can help them in terms of overcoming those challenges? So definitely. Um, Number one, first and foremost, and it's something that I'm still getting better at and working on, is not to take everything personally. It's hard, but you cannot take everything personally. You can't take it all to heart. So some kids love language classes while others dislike them and will pin your class as unnecessary or unimportant. And that's just the way it is. You need to do the best you can so that regardless of students' likes or dislikes, they are learning and progressing. And that's what matters. Even if you hear negative comments or, oh, I don't like this. Oh, why do I have to take this? The reality is at the end of the day, if they're learning, you are doing your job and that's something you should be proud of. 
I would also say it's really important to stay organized. Like I was talking about before to make sure that you're planning your lessons and really teaching in a way that you have your end goal in mind. What are you working towards? So build off of each previous lesson to keep progressing. Keep that common theme. Plan out your week's lessons gradually. Make sure you are measuring students' progress along the way. Make sure you're checking in with them. Constantly build upon what you've taught. Constantly recycle the same grammar, vocab, concept to make sure that the kids are really getting it. Because it's not enough to say, oh, I taught it. I'm done. You really have to keep checking in on them. And that it makes it tricky sometimes, but that's really how you see language acquisition happen. Um, I would say also don't freak out if you need to change your plans. If things don't go exactly as expected, it's okay. And Mm -hmm. that was hard for me at the beginning. I wanted everything to be great. Nothing is perfect all the time and none of us is perfect. So I would say my last piece of advice is to keep learning. None of us knows it all and we can all get better. I would also say take the advice or constructive criticism that is directed at you before rejecting rejecting it and getting upset, which is really hard to do. But you really need to form some bonds with veteran teachers who have your backs and who serve as your mentors. So if those veteran teachers and those mentors to you are giving you some feedback, take it before rejecting it or getting upset. Um, that's something really important because the reality is that none of us is a perfect teacher and you really can't compare yourself to others. Uh, none of us is perfect. None of us has a perfect lesson every day. We all still have a lot to learn and we can all get better and we can all learn from each other. So definitely be open to learning from other people. Absolutely. I mean, this is my 17th year. And every year I still question my pacing. Like, am I teaching this in the right way? Am I going in the right order? Um, I, I feel like I'm never really satisfied and, and I'm always trying to improve and learn. So I completely agree with that. Awesome. I know it's it never ends. So Elena, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. Um, where can my listeners get a hold of you if they want to chat some more about foreign language? So anytime um, anyone can drop me a message at my Twitter account. So my Twitter handle is at S-R-T-A-S-P-A-T-H-I-S. So anyone can find me on there. Send me a message. Feel free to reach out. Um, If you have any questions about articles I've written um, or any questions after this podcast, I'd be happy to chat. Sounds like you should start a Teachers Pay Teacher store also if you have all those resources. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was like, dang, girl, you you could totally sell that stuff. <laughs> I've, been, I've been told that a couple of times and I, I you know, <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put that in the show notes for those of you who are listening so that you can get a hold of Elena and talk shop about foreign language. So thank you again for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, there you go. I told you that Elena had so many amazing techniques and strategies to share with you. Even if you're not a language teacher, a lot of it really applies to all of us, if you think about it. So she talked about how she would teach a skill out of the book, and then she would find her own real life examples to make the teaching more relevant and engaging with her students. I do this as well. I use pop culture or actual advertisements when I'm teaching argumentative and persuasive techniques. And so a lot of the advice that Elena gives us is just really sound. Now, if you remember at the end of the episode, she gave you guys some advice as new teachers. And of course, this applies to all of us, such as not taking everything personally. Hey, I teach reading and writing, and a lot of students hate reading and writing. I mean, it is really, I can see it in their eyes that when I'm asking them to write an essay, they really don't want to do it, but I find ways to make it more engaging for them. But at the end of the day, if they don't like it, they don't like it, but I don't take it personally. It's not because they don't like me. It's because they really struggle with reading and writing or they just find it really boring. So don't take things personally. Also, she mentioned staying organized, which of course... 
I think we all could definitely follow. I could too. I could be a little more organized and just keeping the end in mind and having the big picture and really planning out the steps along the way. You don't necessarily have to have every single lesson in terms of all the activities perfectly planned out because you do have to adjust as you go. But what you do need to know is what is it that my students need to learn right now? And then from there, you just need to come up with some fun and engaging activities that will help get them to that goal. But of course, you have to adjust. And finally, we had this conversation about keeping on learning. We always have to believe that we could always be better. Not that you're not good enough, but there's always a way to improve. I personally am always trying to learn as I did in this podcast because I don't have a lot of experience with foreign language, but I really enjoyed what I learned with Elena. And there's always some way that we can improve and a lot of different ways that you can get this learning is by talking to other colleagues, attending professional development, reading books, or even maybe listening to podcasts, wink, wink. So... I did want to mention again before I go about the end of the year sanity saver. It's not too late. It's a short course. All the lessons are very short and bite sized so that you can definitely watch them like during your prep period or you can watch them during lunch or even nutrition break. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but I promise you all of the techniques and all of the strategies in there are actionable and impactful. And that can be found at teachersneedteachers.com forward slash E-O-T-Y. Thanks for hanging out with me today and have a fabulous week. Thanks for listening to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. Love this episode? Head over to Apple Podcast or Google Play to subscribe, rate, and leave a review.